All right, here we go for chapter 14, depressive disorders. Um, so major depressive disorder, this is persistently depressed mood lasting a minimum of two weeks. Uh, symptoms include, you can read through this list on your own of different symptoms. Anhedonia um, is the lack of joy or not finding pleasure in anything. Um, so, but make sure you read through this list of what the symptoms can include for major depressive disorder. Um, so depressive disorders classified. So there's disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. This is children ages six to 18. Um, we will see these kids have frequent temper tantrums. There's dysthymic disorder. Um, this is feelings of depression that are persistent for two years or more. Uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. This is a week prior to menstruation. So 2.5 to 5.5% of women um, experience this. Um, this is different from <clears throat> just um, the normal premenstrual symptoms that we've talked about um, that you would have talked about hopefully in um, your women's health classes. But um, this is a different type of depression that happens the week before menstruation. There's substance abuse, depressive disorder, and de depressive disorders associated with another medical condition. We're going to keep seeing that. Remember, there's anxiety induced from substance abuse, and there's anxiety induced from another medical condition. Um, so same thing with depression. Substance abuse can trigger depression. Other med medical um, symptoms or conditions can trigger um, depression as well. So the etiology, uh, it's important to remember that the leading cause of disability in the United States is depression. <clears throat> um, you have a breakdown here with 8.3% of children and adolescents, 6.7% of adults. So one in 20 people in the U.S. suffer with depression, and depression is not a normal result of aging. So just because somebody gets older doesn't mean that they're going to be depressed. That's actually a condition that happens that is not a normal part of aging. Uh, comorbidities, so the combination of anxiety and depression is the most common. If you guys recall, we talked about Zoloft, um, and Zoloft is being found to be effective for both depression and anxiety. So a lot of people were seeing on Zoloft, which is an SSRI. Uh, symptoms of anxiety occur in an average of 70% of cases of major depression. So as this tells us, 70%, it goes hand in hand, depression and anxiety. People with chronic medical disorders have a greater incidence of depression than the general population. And why is that? Well, because depression about the whole situation that they're in. And if they have a chronic medical condition that's not going away, you know, and, and we learned and hopefully you learned in your med surge too about chronic conditions, um, that this is something they have to deal with lifelong. So the chance of depression with having a chronic medical condition would clearly be um, increased. Uh, borderline personality disorder has a higher incident, uh, incidence of depression as well. <clears throat> so these primary risk factors, make sure that you know the difference between these and suicidal risk factors. Um, so with depression, female gender is a higher risk. And if you remember back to our suicidal risk factor, males were at a higher risk. So if you read through this list, things like um, being unmarried, having an early childhood trauma, again, we always come back to that, it seems. Um, presence of negative life events such as a loss or humiliation. So, you know, somebody who gets caught for a very egregious crime they've been committing and they're humiliated and they lose their status, you know, they, they would be more at risk for depression. Somebody who loses their spouse um, suddenly or not suddenly would be at higher risk for depression. Um, family history. So we do see that it is, um, it is heredity. We can see it in heredity that people that have parents with depression have a higher increase with depression themselves. People with ineffective coping, postpartum time period, medical illnesses, absence of support systems, um, and alcohol or substance abuse. <clears throat> So genetic, um, twins have 37% chance of having a mood disorder. So if, if somebody is a twin and their twin has it, they have that almost 40% chance. Um, there's biochemical things like stressful life events can change the chemistry in the brain. <clears throat> Neurotransmitter abnormalities, we've been talking a ton about neurotransmitters. Um, stress is associated with brain's ability to produce new brain cells. So if I'm under a high amount of stress, uh, my brain is not rejuvenating or rebuilding its cells the way that it would be if I wasn't under that type of stress. 
Um, so if that's not happening, I have a higher incidence of having depression. Um, the cognitive theory, so there's three assumptions with Beck's cognitive triad. So it's a negative self-depreciating view of self. So the person looks at themselves and feels basically worthless. They don't think that they're worth much. Um, a pessimistic view of the world. So no matter what, the world's a bad place. Um, and the belief that negative enforcement will continue. No matter what I do, I'm still going to be lose, uh, losing. I'm going to be the loser no matter what. doesn't matter what I try to do. Um, if you know anybody that suffers with that, it's not, it's not easy even being a friend to that person because um, the life is, is so negative um, and it's hard to be around that. Um, but imagine actually living that way. So um, we have to remember that, especially with our patients that we're treating for depression. So the nursing um, process, so you have different diagnoses under here. Um, again, this could help you with concept mapping. So you have risk for suicide. Um, safety is always the highest priority, but then the following hopelessness, ineffective coping, social isolation, spiritual distress, self-care deficit. So ECT therapy, um, I, I might have time to show you guys this one too. Let me open this up real quick and see if it happens quickly here. So we're going to get this guy to the point where we saw the other one having the seizure. And that way you can see it in another patient. Obviously, you guys can watch this whole thing on your own as well. If you look over here, there's other ones that you can look up. So she's hyperoxygenating him like they did in the other video that we watched. Okay, so anyway, again, you can watch that on your own, but um, it's really good. I mean, we're finding more and more about ECT, and it's so helpful. Um, and as you noticed in that one, his seizure was a little bit different from the man that we watched the other day, but still not terrible. Like, did not did not look painful, did not look torturous, looked like overall he was, uh, he was comfortable, he won't remember. Um, so antidepressants, so SSRIs, which we've talked about, this is the first line of therapy for depression. Um, constant adherence is crucial. Remember, this is the one that can take from one to four weeks to become effective. So we want to teach the adherence. Um, there's low side effects compared to other antidepressants. Um, it can, they can sometimes be used in anxiety disorders as well. Remember again about Zoloft, that's an SSRI in which we um, use that uh, for both. 
um, adverse reactions. So patients are most bothered by anorgasmia. That's the inability to have an orgasm. Um, so, you know, that's a big thing. I know I talk about that, um, but it's a really big thing that we talk to our patients about possible sexual side effects that they may experience um, and that, that we're open to listening and actually having this conversation because that's embarrassing for them. Um, and then toxic effects, serotonin syndrome, you can read about on um, page 268. It's important to know about serotonin syndrome. Um, tricyclic antidepressants, which we've talked about. Um, remember, these are a little more caustic to the body, and so they were not as used as they used to be. So there's just um, a little list right there that I've given you as far as different things that if you want to research more, you can. Um, I won't be going into major details on tricyclics other than the things that we covered um, in Chapter 3. And then MAOIs, the big thing to take away from that is remember the change in diet, tyramine, knowing the foods that have tyramine in them. Um, so other treatments that we can use, um, you can see that we have ECT there at the top. And if you look down, um, there's vagus nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation, which we talked about in class the other day, light therapy. Um, again, some of these are really good ideas for um, concept mapping, you guys. I mean, any of it, seeing John's or even exercise. Um, okay, so that's it for Chapter 14. I will be on to record the other two in just a minute.